Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and our connection to our own humanity. This is episode 55. It's another joint episode with Melita Thomas of Tudor Times on Thomas More. Just a quick note that the Renaissance English History Podcast is a proud member of the Agora Podcast Network, and check out the Agora Podcast of the Month, which is Lands of Leviathan. It's a podcast that analyzes concepts and theories from political science and international relations using themes, trends, and trivia in popular culture. So you can listen to two nerds discuss state reformation during a zombie apocalypse, or how the Jedi Council would function in our international system. You can learn more and subscribe at landsofleviathan.com. And as always, you can get show notes and more information about the Renaissance English History Podcast at www.englandcast.com, E-N-G-L-A-N-D, cast, englandcast.com. And there you can also sign up for the mailing list. Mailing list subscribers receive an extra mini cast every month, as well as an exclusive Spotify listening list, book giveaways, news, and other cool stuff. And for this particular episode as well, you can get lots more information on Thomas More at tutortimes.co.uk. So moving on from all of those links, let's talk about Thomas More now. So Melita Thomas is a co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a website devoted to Tudor and Stuart history in the period from 1485 to 1625. You can find it at tudortimes.co.uk. Melita, who has always been fascinated by history ever since she saw the 1970s series Elizabeth R. with Glenda Jackson, also contributes articles to BBC History Extra and Britain Magazine. And we started the interview with me asking her what we needed to know about Thomas More. Thomas is definitely one of the most controversial figures of the 16th century, perhaps because he's been recharacterized, shall we say, by the enormous success of Wolf Hall. So, you know, there's been a lot of interest in him of late. He was a Londoner, born and brought up in the city of London. His father was a, a lawyer and later a judge. And he belonged to what you might call the great and the good of the city. His grandfather was an alderman and so forth. Uh, He was educated in London at school, St. Anthony's School, uh, which is in in a later form, still exists. He then went to Oxford where he studied for two years but didn't take his degree, which was quite common in those days. Not everybody took a degree unless they intended to become a priest. He joined the legal profession Uh, like his father, and he studied first of all at New Inn, which was one of the inns of Chancery, and then at Lincoln's Inn, where he became a barrister and qualified in about 1501. He was, you know, successful in his profession, and he just started to move up the ranks of the lawyers in the early 1500s. It's possible he sat in Parliament in 1504, although his biographers are a bit unsure about whether that that's true or not. But whilst he was at Oxford and then in London uh, practicing as a lawyer, he became involved in uh, scholarly circles, I suppose you'd call it, with the, the humanist scholars of the period. He became friends with the uh, most famous Renaissance scholar of them all, Erasmus, uh, with Dr. Collett, who was the Dean of St. Paul's and founded St. Paul's School, with Thomas Lineker, who was tutor to Prince Arthur, with William Grockin, another um, well-known scholar who introduced Greek as a, a study at Oxford. So he, he was part of this circle of uh, humanists, as as they were called afterwards. And he started to move in sort of on the edges of, of what you might call royal circles as you know, th- things were things were quite small in those days. I mean, a, a well a well educated lawyer or a well educated scholar was very likely to become involved in the king's household in some way. It, one of the first stories we have about him it dates from 1499, when he was obviously already well acquainted with the royal family in some way. He went to visit his friend Lord Mountjoy together with Erasmus, and they decided to pay a call on the royal 
uh, children who were at Eltham Palace. And there he met uh, Henry VIII as a little boy, the Duke of York, and uh, Henry's sisters. That was that sort of the first recorded uh, meeting between Moore and Henry. So he continued in his legal profession. In 1512, he sat in Parliament for the City of London. He was interested in some of the big London cases of the 1510s. There was the very notorious case of Richard Hun, which was one of the first examples of uh, of the discord between the clergy and the, the commons. He became involved in a number of negotiations uh, relating to city and commercial law, and he was retained by Cardinal Wolsey to translate for a, a papal envoy, uh, Cardinal Carafa, who was, who was later Pope Paul IV. Uh, so he, he sort of gradually became more prominent in, in legal and administrative circles. He was invited to join the King's Council in 1518, and he undertook a number of ambassadorial trips, I suppose you'd call them, to France and to Flanders, as partly as for trade missions, but also partly for negotiations over a number of treaties. There, there were numerous treaties in the 1510s and 20s between England, between uh, the various parts of the empire ruled by Charles V and between France, and more took part in a number of the of the negotiations and embassy visits. He signed a couple of treaties as one of the English representatives, in particular the treaty that agreed that Francis I of France would marry Princess Mary, or possibly if he didn't marry her, that she would marry his younger son, the Duke of Orléans. Uh, so he, he, he became more and more important as a as a negotiator. But he was largely administrative in his role. He wasn't he never vied with say, Cardinal Wolsey for actually making policy for Henry. He was always uh, a subordinate to Wolsey. In 1529, after Wolsey was dismissed from his post of Lord Chancellor, Moore was appointed as, as Lord Chancellor, so head of the legal profession. At the time, of course, things were very difficult because of Henry VIII's desire to have an annulment of his marriage. What Moore never would never talk about it, and he refused to get involved in it in any way. And Henry agreed that you know he Moore would not be pressed to be involved in it, even though he was Lord Chancellor. However, that was not really a, a tenable position. And eventually, as Henry's demands to control the church became more and more difficult to resist, uh, Moore resigned his position, but Henry was still very eager for him to confirm his agreement. I mean, Moore, Moore was a, he was very well thought of throughout Europe. He was known as a scholar. He was known as a, a man of influence and a man of great wit. And therefore, it was important to Henry that, that somebody who was very well thought of should should approve of his actions, but Moore could not be persuaded to do so. Eventually, um, you know, after a number of requests and demands to conform, Moore was eventually faced with the Act of Succession of 1534, which required everybody who was asked to swear an oath that the king was supreme head of the English church and that his children by his new queen, Anne, were uh, his legal successors. Moore refused to sign the oath. He he wouldn't give any reason for his refusal. Just said he wouldn't wouldn't sign it, and he was imprisoned for about six months. During which time there were repeated requests for him to sign it, but he wouldn't. He would neither take the oath nor would he ever explain why what he objected to in it, on the basis that he didn't wish to incriminate himself. Eventually, he was tried and convicted of maliciously denying the role of Henry as head of the church. And he was executed on the 6th of July, 1535, St. Thomas's Eve. Uh, he was executed by beheading. And why did you choose him for the person of the month? There are a couple of reasons behind it. Uh, one of the reasons that brought him to the forefront of the list was a request from one of our listeners to uh, look at him. She wrote to us and she is uh, apparently one of his descendants. He had uh, four children, uh, at least two of whom had children of their own. 
and to obviously over time these descendants presumably you know just continue to um, expand and anyway this lady wrote to us and said would we look at him so we moved him up the list but of course he is uh, an absolutely pivotal figure in the um, mid uh, early to mid 16th century in the whole history of the English Reformation and you know a very worthy and very complex and interesting man to read about it's very hard to actually form a real view of his character he's he's quite elusive so it's been it's been interesting to read about him Mm. yeah and on that note I know like you mentioned with Wolf Hall there's been a renewed interest in him what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that we have about him well it, it, it is very hard very hard to know anything in the sense that because he he is seen as a religious martyr by some and as a religious persecutor by others you know it's very hard to get anybody who doesn't have a a preconceived view based on their own perceptions of whether the reformation was a good or a bad thing Mm -hmm. so although in his lifetime uh all of the all of the descriptions of him pretty much in his lifetime were positive in that he was um Obviously, a very witty man. People, everybody mentions his his wit, and occasionally you see the odd, the odd sentence that you can see. Um, you know that that, that he, he he did have a, a, a very dry sense of humour, um, but but that's not always popular. So so generally, he's very well spoken of as an honest man, a diligent man, a, a man who, as chancellor, gave good justice and speedy and followed the law, um, but possibly also a very rigid man in his thinking um particularly as he got older uh, uh, the the chronicler edward hall who was a, a supporter of the uh, of the reformation is uh, accuses him of making er, making a joke of everything or making a mockery of everything and uh, not you know just not taking anything seriously enough after his lifetime uh, his his first biographer was his son william roper who wrote during the reign of mary in which time there was obviously a a, a great desire to to promote his um, his defence of the of the Catholic Church, and his son in law was clearly clearly a partial. He 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 was very attached to his father in law. So John Fox, in his book of martyrs, accuses him of being a vicious and sadistic persecutor of heretics. Uh, we've got to bear in mind that um, Fox didn't disagree with the principle of uh, persecuting. For, for religion in principle he just didn't like um when it was his. protestants yes yeah, so so we have to have to take that one with a, a modicum of you know what was happening on both sides throughout the 16th 17th 18th centuries the what you might call the Whig view of history that the reformation was a good thing uh more is was largely seen through fox's eyes although even even detractors tended to confirm his his more positive aspects of being a good chancellor of being a good family man so so no so nobody, nobody was ever all bad about him the catholic church in the late uh, 19th century i think 1886 um sort of resurrected him and beatified him possibly as that was a period in the catholic church when the authority of the pope was being promoted even further so that that's when the doctrine of papal infallibility came about actually not not till the 19th century uh, so more although he wasn't perhaps quite as keen on papal supremacy as he's portrayed uh you know he 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 was a good one to be good one to be um promoting from the from the church's point of view and he was then made a saint in 1935 he was portrayed as a saint in the famous "A Man for All Seasons," that that marvelous film of the nineteen sixties, and it's, you know, it, it's hard for anybody brought up as I was in the, you know, seeing seeing that film as a child, to to not have that vision of him in in your mind. But in uh, Hilary Mantel's "The Wolf Hall," he's definitely portrayed as. Um, not quite the baddie, and actually, as you as you read through it, you become to realise in 
in the two books how much Moore and Cromwell are actually alike in many ways. They're they're sort of the the, the two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. So so it's interesting, but it definitely um it, it's definitely a more negative picture. And and some of the uh, English historians of the nineteen sixties and seventies were very uh, perhaps hung up on their perceptions of uh, sadomasochism and uh, rather worked up about what they saw as Moore's sexuality. Um, that actually looking at what looking at what I can see from the time is not necessarily borne out. It's all a bit post Freudian. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're very worked up about the fact that he used to um, apparently wear a hair shirt. Well, he did wear a hair shirt, and that he um, went for self-flagellation or self-mortification. But although we might see that as a rather strange and you know se- weird sexual practice, it was certainly not uncommon as a religious practice like fasting. Uh, so we shouldn't necessarily read sexual connotations into it. I mean, they might have been there. I mean, I don't know, of course. But it's not necessarily fair to sort of leap from that, e- even though you, you could say he, he was... Um, you know, very concerned about chastity, and he did seem to dwell on that to a degree. It doesn't necessarily mean he was a sadomasochist. It's, it's a bit of a leap. Mm. Um, but he, he, is, he is complicated. It's it's not straightforward. I, I, I probably started off with a more, perhaps a more positive view of him than I've ended up with. Mm. Um, yeah, and, you know, you talked about Hilary Mantel. How have the recent interpretations, is there anything else you can say about how he's changed in the past, say, 30, 40 years? Well, he's definitely gone from being being a saint to a sinner without without sort of passing go or stopping in between. Uh, Peter Ackroyd's biography of him is uh, probably the current what you might call the standard. There was a very there's a very interesting one, very nice style by Richard Marius. That's a bit older. That's that's dating from the eighties. I think we probably I I think it's probably time for him to be seen as neither saint nor sinner, but as like most of us, some somewhere in between. He had his very good points, and he had his not so good points. Although, mm-hmm. of course, it, again, it, it's it, it's looking at the context of the times and how much do you think? How much do we put our own perceptions of what is good or bad or moral or immoral on people of a different time? And sure, to a degree, you you have to. But mm-hmm. I mean, one of the one of the questions I've asked myself is. Um, Around his, around he, he he was definitely a a persecutor of what he considered to be heretics. I mean, there's no no two ways about it. And for those of us who think that religious freedom is is important, that's that's very hard to understand why he hated them with such a such virulence, mm-hmm. and why he was prepared to pursue them to the ends of the law. I'm absolutely certain that he didn't personally lock them up and beat them. Uh, mm. He swore he didn't, and he was a man definitely of his word that you know everything was he did was legal um but then you if you look in the wider context and you realize that his his fundamental belief was that the church was a a union or a communion of souls from the beginning of the christian era right up until the current day that there was no that the whole church was a single union and that for individuals to try to break out of that was was to risk the souls of other people they people and he mm-hmm. wasn't the only one they saw heretics as you know like carrying contagious disease in effect but not not of the body but of the soul and therefore sure. that was you, you know it was every it was the ch- duty of the church and the law to protect the rest of the rest of society from these people and you might also ask and this is one of the questions i have asked is in a in a time ourselves when we're very concerned about war and terrorism and in 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 Moore's time that you know that the peasants war that was seen as provoked by the Lutherans or, although you know obviously it was a lot more complicated than that it was a terrible you know between 100 and 300,000 Germans were slaughtered in a couple of years in mm-hmm. from that so it was seen as unleashing all these terrible forces the sack of rome it, you, you know they they were worried and if you take an analogy of our own day there are many people who think it would be right to lock up people whom they see as peddling quotes violent extremism mm-hmm. 
you know, and everybody's interpretation of that might be be different. But the, the concept of there are people out there and what they say is dangerous to society ha- hasn't changed. So, yeah, yeah, certainly lots to think about, I found. Yes. So uh, he he was also um, a bit of a historian, wasn't he? His um, history on Richard the Third really kind of shaped our views of of the Wars of the Roses and um, and of Richard. Can you tell me about kind of his work as a historian? Well, that's really interesting because, again, until I started to investigate, I had assumed that, yes, history was a, sort of an important pa- part of his you know, quite significant body of work. But actually, Rich III was never finished. It, it was actually written It's part. It's in, in two versions. There's a Latin one and an English one that he appeared to be writing more or less side by side. Mm. But it, it, it was never finished and it was never published. It perhaps, you know, it's often been castigated as being uh, propaganda written to please the Tudors but actually that doesn't ne- that's not necessarily the case it was it was not a work that he published or promulgated in any way hmm. it's possible that he wrote it as a sort of grammatical or rhetorical advice for his um his children mm-hmm. with a huge interest in education and uh, in a very modern way he he was a great believer in education for women yeah, so Richard the uh, Third was it meant as serious history? There were there were obvious errors in it, you know, regardless of your views on Richard the Third's character, that more probably knew weren't true, like the age of Edward the Fourth when he died. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, some of the things that people have said weren't true, as uh, like Richard's um, spinal deformity, they they actually were true. So. Mm. It's possible that it wasn't quite the you know runaway bestseller that everybody thinks right. it was. Right. Yeah. I I heard a little bit just separate about uh, he's like the main source of information about uh, Edward's mistress. What was her name? Jane Shore. Yes. And he wrote a lot about her because she was still alive at the time that he was writing. And uh, he was quite complimentary to her, I think, talking about how she was such a beautiful lady now. And she was older, of course, at the time and how she's kept her beauty through the years and uh, seemed to really, I don't know, seems to paint a really nice picture of her, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't read his, his history of Richard the third, yeah. but, but yes, that he, he spoke, I mean, Jane Shaw, um, whether it was just more, but all, all all that's ever been written about her suggests that she was a she was a a, a nice woman, a, a a a very friendly, affectionate woman who used used the influence she had with Edward the Fourth for good. Uh, she was a Londoner, and Sir Thomas More throughout his life was always a Londoner, and he was always um, keen to promote the city and to m- promote its its virtues so he was he was likely to think that that a goldsmith's wife from london was was a was a good girl right right, right. <laughs> um so tell me about his work as chancellor and you know what he did as the reformation started to take hold and and what he did to kind of fight that and you kind of alluded to his persecution of heretics but yeah. tell me more about that well it, in in his youth and as a humanist more was was not you know he was not some sort of reactionary who thought that everything that the that the church did or said was was right he was he promoted erasmus's new translation of the bible even though quite a lot of conservative um churchmen objected to it he was not he was not a supporter of what you might call the superstitious um element that had had certainly crept into the church you know uh, stories that if you said the rosary every day it didn't matter how bad you were you weren't going to go to hell so he he was Mm. quite dismissive of that that sort of um superstition but his his central view was that the, the the church itself as a as a spiritual body was was important that it it wasn't just what was written in the bible although that was clearly the most important source of the truth but that custom and tradition and the views of church councils and the overall history of the church were also relevant to to how people should believe and how 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 the world should should be conducted he definitely believed that even if the priest himself were bad that did not mean that 
the church was bad. So so he he was perfectly well aware that there were very bad priests and monks, but and also very good ones. But he he held the traditional view that even if the priest himself were bad, it didn't it didn't mean the institution itself was was flawed. Whereas the um, the reformers, or certainly the more there were many of them who felt that the church, because some of the members themselves were so corrupt, that that necessarily meant that the church itself was was severely or seriously flawed. Mm-hmm. So in his in his younger days, he was certainly a, a promoter of reform within the church, and he supported uh, Erasmus and others who who were keen to improve morality within the church. I mean. By the early 1500s, many of the churchmen in in England were, were certainly improving. Um, uh, Fisher of Rochester, of course, who was who was killed at the same time as Moore, Bishop Fox, um, Wareham, you, you know, they 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 were all good churchmen. Wolsey, not so much, and Wolsey was in many ways a, an archetype of the of the churchman who was too too wealthy, too ambitious, too powerful. But once once Luther came upon the scene, then Moore started writing in uh, tracts against against him. His first one actually is you know, pretty revolting. Henry VIII had written a book against Luther, and he was very proud of his book, uh, the assertion of the um, seven sacraments against Martin Luther. And for this, the Pope gave Henry VIII the title Defender of the Faith, and Moore had worked with him on it. He wa- he hadn't um, written the book, but as with all books, you know, Henry had discussed it with him and, and what have you. Luther responded to the King's book with a really shocking and abusive personal attack. Now, Luther's language was very, very um, scatological, and that was obviously the custom of the time. So Henry couldn't couldn't write back to Luther in those sorts of terms. So Moore was commissioned to write a refutation of Luther. And basically, it's you know all, all all that Luther does is talk about shit, and all that Moore does is talk about shit in return. I mean, endless mm-hmm. in in those words or, or or worse. So so that's all pretty pretty revolting, but uh, you know fairly standard for the time. Mm-hmm. So a number of his works against heresy are are in those those sorts of terms, which is somewhat distasteful. But he also wrote um, more more considered works about religion himself uh, later in his life, uh, which were much more about his own sort of more religious and looking at the sacraments and looking at the passion of Christ uh, per se, rather than as reputations of heresy. As Lord Chancellor, it was his job to oversee the law, of course, and it was his job to support the church in its battle against heresy. So Mm -hmm. as the law stood at the time, the church would investigate allegations of heresy, and if they were found to be valid and the heretic refused to recant, then the church would hand over the the heretic to to the state, to the secular arm for punishment. Mm-hmm. And punishments generally were public recantation, or that the heretic would be sent off to um, to look at a fire, and, and his book and books would be thrown into it, or they'd have to throw a faggot of, of mm-hmm. wood into it as a, as a symbol. Mm-hmm. It was people were burnt throughout the uh, the Middle Ages. It was in the range of uh, I'm not minimising it. I think there were I think there were four or five burnt during Henry the Seventh's reign, quite a few burnt, burnt under Henry the Fourth, but you know those are the sorts of numbers generally, most heretics recanted, and depending on what the local bishop was like, you know people paid more or less attention to to them. I, Wolsey was definitely not interested in persecuting people; he would uh, you know call them before him, give them a good scare, and you know more or less tell them to be on their way more there were more burnt under under Moore's chancellorship and there had uh, nobody was burnt under Wolsey's chancellorship and i think it's probably about 10 i the the figures seem it seem a little muddled about 10 were burnt whilst Moore was chancellor but of course against that you have to you have to put the fact that it was right at the forefront of public discussion by then whereas during the 15th and early 16th centuries it had not not been an issue 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, people, it, Moore wasn't the only one who was worried about heretics. Mm-hmm. You know, lots and lots of people were, and very many people were seeing it as, you know, almost the thin end of the wedge. As I mean, Europe was very, very torn by war. I mentioned the German Peasants' War. The Turks were invading in uh, the east, in, in the east of Europe, and, you know, people people felt under siege. Mm-hmm. His other role as chancellor was in the in the secular courts, and the chancellor's job is to be is head of equity. So where the common law doesn't give a good remedy, or gives a remedy that is manifestly unjust, then the the courts of equity can intervene, and uh, that was that was Moore's role. He he heard a lot of cases. He was he was obviously um, a popular judge. People people chose to be heard by by his courts rather than by the, um, the the king's bench, which was the common law. So what was his relationship like with Henry and, and how did that change throughout his life? I think, I think Henry probably had a different view of it from that which Moore had. Mm. As I mentioned, his first meeting with Henry or the, his first published meeting with Henry, presumably he'd, he'd seen him before, was when Henry was about 10 and Moore would have been about uh, in his early 20s, 23 or so. And he took Erasmus to see Henry because he thought he was, you know, a very impressive child, 10 years, 10 years old. And when Henry became king, Moore wrote some very um, flattering verses about how everybody was happy that the miserly old Henry the Seventh was dead and how delighted they were with the new prince who was uh, clever and mm-hmm. um, tall and handsome and all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And it would appear that, you know, although more often wrote with his tongue in his cheek, it would appear that he, he was genuinely impressed with the young Henry. When he first became one of Henry's counsellors, uh, which he resisted for a while because he enjoyed his law practice and he liked being you know, um, in, this, in city politics rather than necessarily getting involved in, in government, uh, he, went, he went and swore the oath to Henry at, at Reading Abbey. And Henry uh, told him he was to be God's servant first and then the king's, which obviously uh, Moore took very much to heart. Mm. But he became, he was on very good terms with Henry after that. They had a lot of intellectual interests in common, uh, astronomy in particular. They would uh, go up onto the roof and look at the stars. Uh, mathematics, Henry was quite a keen mathematician mm-hmm. and Latin, of course. And Henry would often call Moore to join him and Queen Catherine after after supper for just conversation and um, you know private private evenings together. So he was, insofar as you can be a friend of the king, he was he was friends with the king and queen. But he was always rather chary of how much influence he really had uh, when people complimented him on how much the king relied on him. Moore was always um, quick to say that he you know that he he didn't have any influence. And I think there's one quote where he said. Um, that if a castle would, uh, that, that if his head would win Henry a castle in France, he would not hesitate to have mm-hmm. it. And that was, um, so perhaps he understood a bit more about what it's like to be a friend of a king. And then, but Henry, it, it was obviously extremely important to Henry that Moore agreed with him. He went to huge lengths to persuade Moore to accept Henry's supremacy. It, it clearly mattered to Henry on a personal level. It wasn't like Fisher, even though he'd known Fisher all his life. Fisher had been one of his grandmother's closest friends. There isn't the same personal feeling about it. He he really wanted Moore to, to agree with him. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that Moore was so insistent on not accepting the supremacy? Because he saw it as the thin end of the wedge for breaking up the universality of the church. Mm. Un, unlike possible later interpretations, he wasn't ever that excited about the Pope as the supreme head of the church. He was much more inclined to the view that the church as a whole owned the truth, that councils were important, that the Pope was only a source of authority within the church, although he was the the supreme source of authority. He wasn't. He wasn't sort of the only one. So he wasn't quite as enamoured of papal supremacy a, as a concept. And in fact, he objected or suggested to Henry that in Henry's own book, he ought to tone down his 
views of papal supremacy. Once, once the once the un, unity of the church was challenged, that's that is what he couldn't couldn't mm-hmm. accept. It wasn't that he couldn't accept reform within the church or that things didn't need to improve or change, but to to break it up was that's was what he feared. As far as the succession of Anne as queen and the succession of her children, he said that he was he was willing to to accept that he he accepted that that was within the, the competence of the English Parliament to to agree. It was just that the the act is drawn, the act of succession, you couldn't swear to one without the other. Mm. So it was not a political thought about um, Queen mm. Anne. What was the um, what was his the view of him immediately after his death, and were there any repercussions in international circles for Henry or within his own parliament and his own country? Um, yes and no. I mean, the internationally, people seemed wildly surprised that Henry would have had a man who was so universally in 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 Europe thought of as a as a great scholar and a statesman to executed you know Charles V and Francis I both sort of expressed surprise that, that that such a man had been executed the letter immediately written after by the French ambassador was that um you know quote such was the miserable end of Moore who was formerly in great reputation and much loved by the king his master and regarded by all as a good man even to his death mm-hmm. so yeah, there was general surprise but nobody nobody did anything about mm-hmm. it i mean there was nothing nothing that they could do or should do it was you know it it was up to henry and it, what to do in his own realm from that perspective at home uh, i think probably everybody who had had second thoughts about signing the oath of supremacy queued up to sign it. It was probably one of the elements that in 1536 led to the pilgrimage of grace. I mean, not specifically as a retaliation for for the death of Moore, but it was one of the events that made Henry's attack on the church and tradition more unpalatable. Mm. There was no, no direct repercussion. And later on in his life, did Henry ever regret his death? I have come across suggestions that he did, although possibly uh, in in that he wanted to blame somebody else for it. So there is a story that he and Anne quarrelled, and he and Anne frequently quarrelled, it would seem, uh, and that he accused her of being responsible for the death of the best men in his kingdom. But that was typical Henry. He always wanted to blame somebody else for his own actions as soon as he thought better of them. I would guess from you know there's a bit of pop psychology which as you know I'm very Mm -hmm. fond of um Henry Henry was not a man who ever liked to take responsibility for unpalatable actions Mm -hmm. he was always very quick to um distance himself from from things that turned out not to be quite what he'd quite what he'd hoped and he was I don't know whether this is is this narcissism. He, he everything was always somebody else's fault. Henry Henry was always a victim of somebody else's um, you know lies or deceits or betrayal or mm. whatever. He was a man who did seem very very upset at what he thought of as personal betrayals. And if you look at the people he punished, they were very often those who he thought um, were his friends or that he loved, who he felt had betrayed him. So Moore and herself, probably, perhaps Catherine to a lesser degree, and then later the the Marquis of Exeter, uh, Edward Neville. Quite a lot of the people who were who were executed after the Pilgrimage of Grace and the the alleged Exeter conspiracy are people who've been very close to him, and he seemed to really struggle with his friends not agreeing with mm-hmm. him. Um, so, I I guess if he regretted it. It would be more along the lines of regretting that it, that Moore hadn't seen how right Henry was all along, and that Moore had probably brought it on himself. I would have thought would be his view. Mm. Where can we go for le- more information to learn more about him? I know we can't really cover him all in completely in this podcast. So, where can people go to learn more? Uh, well, one of the one of the books I've really liked and uh, a daughter's love by John Guy. It's a it's a joint biography of Thomas and his daughter Margaret, and one of the things we haven't really mentioned is his 
his very warm and affectionate family life, his, particularly his daughter Margaret, he was deeply attached to. He, he, education for women was important to him, not you know, in the sense of going to university or whatever, but he believed, unlike many people of his time, that women were as intellectually capable as men and that they could and should uh, be educated. That's, that's a really nice book, A Daughter's Love, Thomas and, Thomas and Margaret Moore by John Guy. There's the Peter Ackroyd uh, biography, which is solid, shall we say. There's an awful lot of other information in there. There's the early biography by William Roper, which, of course, is is of the time, but not always 100% accurate on facts from what can be uh, gleaned from other sources. There's the Richard Marius one from the 80s, which is very good, although it's very long on, on theology, this one. And there's the Jasper Ridley, a statesman and a fanatic, but I think he he's a bit too hung up on his, um, his sadomasochism bit. Mm. Yeah, just what, one of the sort of thoughts on that with the whole education piece is that in those days, it was very common for children to be beaten. I mean, that was that was pretty pretty much standard fare. But Sir Thomas More, he would beat his children with peacock feathers. So he 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 was obviously not into into physical chastisement mm. nearly as much as some of his contemporaries were. Mm. Yes, yeah, so as I say, it's a bit difficult to get away from some of the sort of hagiography of the of the the, the saint stuff. Mm-hmm. But th- those, those three are good. Excellent, and of course your website. Indeed, mm-hmm. indeed. But um, obviously we're we're confined with words. I mean, there's so much more one could say about it than we've, we've, we're going to manage to squeeze into the website. Sure, <laughs> sure. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. And is there anything else that you wanted to say about him? I'm going. I'm going to make one little quote. I don't know whether you can fit this one in mm-hmm. or not. It, it's sort of to do with his sense of humour. When he was, he was on a mission to uh, Flanders and the other ambassadors were boasting about how much more sophisticated their languages were and more challenged them to say a sentence in any of their languages, which he would, which he would repeat. So, you know, they did the French and Latin and Spanish or whatever. So he repeated it. And then he said, I'll wager you can't repeat an English sentence. And he said, you know, repeat after me. Thwaites thwacked him with a thwittle. <laughs> <laughs> a thwittle is, a, is, is an old-fashioned uh, whittling knife. Thank you again to Melita Thomas for taking the time to talk to us about Thomas More. For more information on him, go to tutortimes.co.uk or see the resources available on the EnglandCast site at englandcast.com. In about two more weeks, we'll be back with a guest episode from James of the Queens of England podcast, and he's going to be talking about Bessie Blunt, Henry VIII's mistress, who bore him his only acknowledged illegitimate son. So stay tuned for that. That was Henry Fitzroy. So she was Henry Fitzroy's mother. So stay tuned for that in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much for listening, and have a great couple of weeks. Talk to you soon. Ich hatte Bord im Baubrick, hat so lissemlies on sich, nennt's cool, meiden auf mich, fern, fred von.